Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing IBM stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. IBM is a technology and consulting company with headquarters in Armonk, New York. It has 350,000 employees serving clients in 170 countries. IBM produces and sells computer hardware, middleware, and software. It also provides hosting and consulting services in areas ranging from mainframe computers to nanotechnology. It is also a major research organization holding the record for the most U.S. patents generated by any business. The company invented the floppy disk, the hard disk drive, relational database, SQL programming language, the UPC barcode, and dynamic random access memory. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 114 billion market cap. They're trading at 128 a share and they have 891 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see the company has pretty consistent free cash flow each year, 11 to 13 billion dollars. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that goes from $5.8 billion up to $8 billion. Revenue is the sales for the company, and that's fairly steady. It's declining a little bit from $79 billion to $75 billion. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. The difference is the gross profit, and that's pretty steady each year, around $36 billion. Even with lower revenue in 2019 and the trailing 12 months, they seem to have similar gross profit. They're managing their expenses better and becoming more efficient. Then you have operating expenses below that, and gross profit minus operating expenses is their operating income. And that's the lowest in the trailing 12 months at $9.3 billion. It peaked in 2018 at $13 billion. The company has a lot of debt, so they had $1.2 billion of interest on their debt. Then there's other income and expenses, which are usually investments and impairments. Then you have your taxes. It looks like they had a $564 million tax rebate in the trailing 12 months. So their net income is higher than their pre-tax income. And the reason they had low net income in 2017 was because they had really high taxes. In 2017, the U.S. government applied a one-time tax penalty to companies that were keeping cash overseas. The reason companies were keeping so much cash overseas was to avoid paying the high taxes in the United States. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. Then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. That's between three and four billion dollars a year. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And they have lots of free cash flow each year. The company pays a nice dividend, but another way to reward shareholders is to buy back stock. And they buy back lots of stock. Four and a half billion in 2017, another four and a half billion in 2018, and then 1.6 billion in 2019. When a company buys back stock, that decreases the shares in the market, which makes the current shares more valuable. They also issue quite a bit of debt. In 2017, they issued $9.6 billion and paid down $6.8 billion. In 2019, they issued $31 billion of debt and only paid down $13 billion. So they added a lot of debt that year. Companies issue debt to fund their operations or pay dividends. But this company has lots of free cash flow to do that. So I think they're issuing debt to acquire other businesses. The most important part of any business is their operating cash flow. And this company has lots of operating cash flow. To calculate that, you start with net income that was $7.9 billion, and then you have to add back the non-cash items on the income statement. They pass through $6.6 .6 billion of depreciation, so we have to add that back. They also had $869 million of stock-based compensation, 
and they had an increase of $2 billion in changes in working capital. Even though they reported $8 billion of profit, they actually generated $16 billion of cash flow because net income is accounting profit and loss. It's not actual cash. Let's look at a capital structure, 24% equity, 76% debt. So they're really leveraged and their WAC is 8% and that's a discount rate we're gonna to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flow of past year four, that's 195 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $179 billion. We divide that by 891 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 201. They're trading at 128, so they're trading at a 36% discount. It's a buy according to the model. Simply, Wall Street values the company at 171, so they're also saying the stock is undervalued. The stock seems to be going down little by little over the years. It looks like it peaked about $170, $180 a few years back, but it's sitting at 128. So it looks like a really good value, at least according to my model and simply Wall Street. This company raises its dividend each year. Their dividend payment is over 5%. To calculate their dividend payment, you can just add up the last four dividend payments, sum those up, then divide by the stock price. And they pay out 73% of their net income and 46% of their free cash flow. The company has a beta of 1.24, so the stock moves a little more than the market. The stock has gone down 8% in the past 52 weeks, much worse than the S&P 500. The low was 91, the high was 159. They are trading above their 50-day and 200-day moving average, so it seems to be in an uptrend. About 5.5 million shares are traded each day for the stock, and almost all the shares outstanding are on float and about 59% of the shares are held by institutions, and almost 3% of the shares are shorted for this stock. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago and reinvested the dividends, you'd have 11800 today. If you did not reinvest the dividends, you'd have the same amount, 11800 So if you invested $10,000 in this company in January 2011, you could have sold for close to $15,000 at its peak, and you would have been in the red a couple of times. Not such a good return on investment, only 1.68% annual return. Vanguard owns the most shares at 8.3%, then BlackRock at 6.8%, State Street, Geode, and Charles Schwab. Let's look at the financial ratios. The average PE in the market is 11.2, the median is 14.4, PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They have a 14.5 PE, which means investors are paying $14.50 for $1 of earnings. Price of sales is stock price of a sales per share. They're at 1.5. That's much better than the median and average. Price to book is stock price of a book value per share. They're at 5.5, about the average. And the way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities in a balance sheet, and they have 21 billion of equity. But if you look at the tangible equity, it's negative $53 billion because they have almost $74 billion of intangible assets on their balance sheet. They have $58 billion of goodwill and $15 billion of other. A company cannot internally generate intangible assets. The only way a company can get an intangible asset on their balance sheet is when they acquire another company. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. They can cover their interest payments seven times. ROE is net income over equity. 38% ROE, that's great. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. They can just cover the current liabilities with their current assets. Their current assets are nine billion of cash, 24 billion of receivables, and 1.6 billion of inventory. The company does seem to be well capitalized. They have $13 billion of free cash flow in a trailing 12 months. They do have a little working capital, and they also have to pay a $5.8 billion dividend payment. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies. I've done videos of 12 companies in the same industry as IBM. And if IBM has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. So they're a lot worse in PE because the PE is skewed with these negatives. They are doing much better in price to sales and price to book. Current ratio, they're a little lower than the average, but at least they're above one. They're doing great in ROE. 
They're really high in debt. They're one of the highest in this industry. And they have a really big market cap, 114 billion. It's second largest to Accenture, which is 168 billion. And they pay a really good dividend, over 5%, much bigger than any company in this industry. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 36% discount. They're still bringing in lots of free cash flow. Their revenue is fairly steady. It's not growing, but $75 billion is still a big revenue number. And they're such a big company with so much intellectual property and knowledge and patents. This is definitely a stock you could hold on for long term. They're going to be around for the rest of our lives. That's for sure. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.